suits you and everyone else, to be honest. I think everyone needs a bit of a break for lunch. We, we could say half an hour or 40 minutes. I don't really mind, whichever, whatever people prefer. Um, Half an hour is fine. Yeah, thirty minutes. Yeah, thirty minutes. Fine. So quarter two. Yeah. That's lunch. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. See you, you later. Time. See you. People join. Should we get started then? Some yeah. people may have decided not not to uh, attend the afternoon, or may have got other meetings on. Yeah, press on. Okay. Uh, yeah, do you want to stop sharing yeah. then? Yeah. That. Coming through to everyone now? Yep. Yeah. Excellent. In that case, I will start. Um, as I said, I'm Richard Underhill um, from Fraser Nash Consultancy. I'm the technical lead for the Bayes Thermal Hydraulics Project. Um, as many of you are aware, uh, this is part of the UK government um, Bayes, so the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Nuclear Innovation Programme. Um, this is a, about 180 million pounds of funding that began in 2016 and, and finishes in 2021. So we're sort of near the end of this, this program. And it's, it's a sort of phased program, um, particularly aimed at upskilling UK, UK community um, in emerging nuclear technology. So what I mean by that is advanced reactor designs. So we're looking at the sort of Gen 4 technologies um, and SMRs and it's, it's getting the UK to become an international partner of choice so so how does the UK participate in the international programs that are going on um, and nuclear thermal hydraulics is, is part of what Bayes have called digital reactor design so it's how can we use sort of current tools to design reactors and there's a, a number of different phases or programs within that um, there's the, the thermal hydraulics model development. Um, phase one began in 2017 and went through to 2019. And then phase two carried that on in 2019 and goes to 2020 to 21. Alongside that, we've got the nuclear virtual engineering capability development, NVEC, which is being led by Jacobs, um, who we would. Um, and that's looking at uh, a virtual sort of engineering platform to run a range of different tools and tool sets. Um, and the other side of it is the nuclear thermal hydraulics facility, which is being delivered at the moment by UKAA. Um, and as, as mentioned in the nuclear sector deal, that's a, a 40, billion, 40 million pound proposed new thermal hydraulics facility, um, ideally placed in, in Bangor. And that's currently going through sort of business case development and, and concept design. Um, it's worth noting that we've now Fraser Nash also delivered phase one of the program, um, which finished um, sort of last year. All of the, the outputs from that phase one program have now been sort of finalized and approved by Bayes um, to publish, and the aim is to make them available. Uh, I have to say, uh, we were hoping to get the, the website there um, updated with that, those downloads and the publications to make them available to you now. Um, unfortunately, it's not quite gone live. Um, it is approved, it's ready, and, and should go live in the next few days. So I will, I will send an email to everyone in this meeting um, with information about when that website is updated. Uh, and from that, you'll be able to download um, 12 of the, the phase one reports, uh, looking at the research that was done in phase one and the user requirements and, and state-of-the-art reviews. Um, and and that, that information will be available. Within phase two, it is a two year program. So we, we're now just over halfway through. Um, and there are three core things that we're delivering. There's a, a set of technical volumes 
that, that we, we're, we're aiming to define, define good practice and, and help people understand how to do thermal hydraulic analysis. There's a set of four case studies that go alongside the technical volumes to demonstrate that good practice and, and how to apply the knowledge in the technical volumes. And then at the same time, there's a, a set of research and development that's being undertaken at the University of Manchester and the University of Sheffield that, that, that's aimed to fill in gaps in that, in that knowledge. Alongside that, that core aim, we've also got a key requirement to, within the program to collaborate and integrate with the other nuclear innovation programs uh, and also international research um, and hold dissemination events to promote what we're, we're outputting. Um, and, it, and it's a shame that the, the event that was planned to be held in London in April, um, that the sort of last special interest group meeting um, had to be cancelled because of COVID. Um, it's, it's a shame that we couldn't give you a more detailed update then and, and this event is, is, is helping to do that. Um, we are intending to hold a, a larger event at the end of this programme um, to, to hold a seminar to, to go through the technical volumes and case studies in more detail and, and when we formally can publish them. In terms of the team, um, a lot of the team are on the call at the moment. Um, so obviously we've got um, Fraser Nash leading it and the University of Manchester and Sheffield undertaking a lot of the research. But we've also got a, a number of reactor developers involved as well. So we've got EDF Energy R&D um, and Westinghouse who have been involved in the program from the start. Um, but we've also brought in a number of the advanced reactor developers to support us and, and bring in that industry um, application and, and relevance um, from, from a number of these different technologies. So we've got U battery and DBD from a, a sort of gas, high temperature gas reactor design. Um, lead cold and Westinghouse from a, a lead reactor design. And terrestrial energy and Maltex from molten salt. Um, and then Rolls Royce and, and Westinghouse on a sort of PWR, SMR knowledge. We've also involved the National Nuclear Laboratory um, and bringing their, their experience and, and knowledge from across the UK. Um, nuclear industry. So it's bringing together industry and academia in order to provide something that's, that's relevant, that, that's taking the research from university and bringing it into industrial application. Phase two programme, we obviously can't do everything in thermal hydraulics, it's, it's obviously too broad a field so we have had to uh, narrow it down uh, quite a bit. But the aim is very much on industrial application and commercialization. So this is about exploiting UK government funding to try and develop the UK nuclear industry and bring and get the UK industry involved in a lot of the research and reactor development that's going on around the world. And the focus for our work is very much on, on the predictive capability for passive safety. Um, so looking at passive safety systems and also that focusing on single phase heat transfer and natural convection. As I say, we can't do everything, so we are looking at single phase flow um, and cutting out the sort of multi-phase and boiling aspects. Um, for a lot of the advanced nuclear technologies, this is, uh, multi-phase flow is less relevant. Um, you don't, uh, part of the reason for using liquid metal and molten salt is that their boiling points are, are much higher. Um, and so you don't get that issue. Um, and so at the beginning, the key is to upskill the UK. So coming out to you guys and getting this information to people so that they can use it. And hopefully in a way that is useful for you um, and relevant to the advanced nuclear technologies. So that the, the four liquids or coolants that we're looking at are water, high temperature gas, liquid metal, and molten salt. So that, that covers lead and sodium. A simple schematic of the program shows sort of at a high level where we are in the program and what's going on. We've, we've now, as I say, sort of well over uh, halfway into the program. So we've, we've now drafted the technical volumes um, and got a sort of good draft of all of them. And the plan is to finalize them before the end of the year. We've got the, the research and development ongoing throughout the two years. And we've now well into undertaking the case studies. We've defined what they are and identified the scope in, in, in discussion with a number of our industry partners. 
um, and now starting to deliver them. And throughout the process and program, we're, we're, we're going through integration and dissemination and collaboration. So just to give you a, a quick summary of each of these core areas before you, you go, we go into, into a bit more detail later on. Um, techni technical volumes, we've got six technical volumes. Um, and the aim of these is to provide a clear and concise and useful overview. So these are these are, are, are meant to be easy to read and useful, and to assess engineers in providing good quality analysis. So it's understanding what what is best practice. The six volumes that we've got. Um, the first one is an introduction, so looking at, at introducing the volumes and and providing some of the background. Conjugate heat transfer, natural convection and passive cooling. So again, looking at the focus around passive safety. Confidence and uncertainty, which is, is relevant to all analysis in the nuclear industry in terms of understanding how it can be used and quantifying it. And then the last two volumes are very specific around the sort of more unusual coolants that, that, are, that we're interested in, liquid metal and molten salt, and some of the, the individual aspects associated with them. The next part of the program is the, the case studies, which Graham McPherson will talk about in a bit. And there's four case studies. Um, and these are very much worked examples of what is in the technical volumes and demonstrating the modeling approaches that we're, we're talking about. And again, we've tried to cover a range of different reactor types and coolants. So the first one is looking at, at CFD modeling of the tall 3D facility, which is a, a lead bismuth eutectic loop um, and it's a, it's a validation test case against experimental data. The second one um, is looking at the fuel assembly and doing CFD in, a, in an MSR molten salt reactor. So again looking at the quantifying the uncertainty in the heat transfer predictions due to the material properties. The third one again looking at a, a lead reactor design um, this is based on the, the Westinghouse lead fast reactor looking at CFD modeling of, a, of a, the whole core, um, a reactor scale. Finally, the last one, looking at system code and CFD analysis for light water SMR. So this is looking at, again, a validation test case for a water-based reactor. The third part of the program is, is the R&D. As I said, this is intended to address gaps in knowledge. So it's very much bridging the gap between academia and industry with the aim that the industry can then exploit this research going forwards. And this continues some of the, the research that was done in phase one. And there are three key parts that again, that we'll go into a bit more detail later on. First one there is natural circulation loops being looked at at the University of Manchester. Coarse grid CFT or sub-channel CFT and the, the developments in that code that's being done at the Sheffield. And finally, looking at in more detail at liquid metal heat transfer, both in terms of, of convection flows and, and mixing being done at the University of Sheffield. The last part of the program is looking at the integration and dissemination. So this is how we're linking with all the work going on in the UK and internationally. Um, as I mentioned at the start, there's, there's a couple of parallel parts to the nuclear innovation program. First one looking at the NVEC tool set. So we need to make sure that the thermal hydraulics work that we're doing integrates with that tool set. Um, and we're working with Jacobs to combine and, and, and look at integrating some of the cases. And the, on the other side, on the facility side, we're also talking regularly to UKAA and looking at how we can align our model development with the capability that the facility will hopefully be able to offer and the, the tests that, that we can do to validate some of our predictions. Internationally, we've engaged on the Nuclear Energy Agency, NEA, CFD working group and are currently participating in the, in the benchmark looking at fluid st structure interaction. Um, so this is looking at, at two cylinders um, with vortex shedding and moving due to the, the flow on them. Um, and there's, this is participating in, in with um, 
Elia, um, who mentioned it earlier at the beginning, and a number of other UK research institutions. And our results will feed into the, the benchmark. We're working with international developers as well, like I mentioned earlier, Westinghouse, Terrestrial, um, and to build up those links and relationships and engaging um, internationally. Finally, on the dissemination side, um, we're holding these May meetings, the, the thermal hydraulics special interest group meetings. Um, and as I mentioned, there will be a, a two day seminar at the end to share the project outcomes and make the reports that we generate available to everyone. That's it, it I had at the beginning um, on the overview side. I don't know if there's any questions on that at the moment or whether it's just move, worth moving straight on to the technical volumes, um, which I will, I will go through and then pass on to Graham McPherson to look at the case studies. So looking at the, the technical volumes in a bit more detail and what we're doing, the purpose of the volumes, um, as far as the, the requirement from Bayes is, uh, written at a very high level, is a set of open source documents um, focused on thermal hydraulic phenomena to describe good practice for industry and regulators and summarizing the state of the art with respect to SMRs and AMRs. So it's quite broad. As I said earlier, we need to, to refine that and make it relevant. It's being written by Fraser Nash, but we are getting lots of great contributions from an industry steering group um, and an advisory group that includes uh, a number of international figures. So the six volumes are, are intended to be clear, concise and useful. So these are not intended to be long academic um, papers or, or documents, they're very much for industry use, understanding what the phenomena are and, and how to analyze them within a civil nuclear contest. And it's very much about helping engineers to perform good quality analysis. So the motivation, as I say, it's very high level. We want to upskill the UK and it's great to see a lot of the UK thermal hydraulics community here today. And, and the fact that we are getting together like this in these meetings to, to talk about and, and find out what research everyone's doing. Um, but it's, it's looking at the analysis methods, specifically focused at advanced nuclear technologies. With the aim of presenting it in an accessible form and links to some of the core international references and best practice documents like the CSNI and, and other documents, but bringing it together in a single place so that people can read it easily and quite quickly. So we are looking at sort of we're aiming at around 60 to 70 pages each. We're hoping to, that these will be a benefit to a, a, a range of different engineers looking at, at different levels. So right from the start, the young engineers, when you just graduated, help them support learning how to perform thermal nuclear thermal hydraulic analysis. Looking at, at thermofluids engineers, so non-nuclear engineers, helping them understand some of the methods and tools and context for undertaking analysis for the civil nuclear industry. Also intended to help engineers that are already doing nuclear thermal analysis, helping them understand about the state of the art and develop their knowledge of advanced nuclear technologies. And finally, we're looking a bit broader than that, helping people out in other nuclear disciplines and engineering managers. So understanding how the nuclear thermologic analysis can support them or allow them to act as an intelligent customer and when to do nuclear analysis within a reactor development program. So uh, just to go through a little bit more detail about each of the volumes. On the introductory volume, as the name would suggest, it introduces the topic and the context around it from industry and regulatory perspectives. And it sets the scene. So looking at the contents there, we, we go into a bit of the background and purpose behind the work to describe some of the safety benefits and design benefits of thermal hydraulic analysis. 
what does passive cooling applications mean and what do we mean by advanced nuclear technologies? We then look at a bit of the motivation for why do we need nuclear power and the value behind it. As, as we've mentioned previously, you know, the UK has got to get to net zero by 2050. And I think nuclear has got to be a key part of that. And developing the analysis skills to help us do that is, is what's needed. But also the safety and licensing context. That's one of the key differences between our industry and, and some of the other industries around that use CFD. Validation and the, the end use of the CFD to justify a nuclear safety case is a, a key aspect of the work. And what are the, the, the hoops and difficulties in achieving that? What are the technical volumes in case studies? What are they about, the objectives? And then a bit of general information on thermal hydraulic analysis as a whole. So the analytical approach, looking at empirical calculations, system codes and CFD analysis, but also some of the, the, the terms that are used and the techniques involved in, in nuclear safety case work. So PERT, so phenomena identification and ranking tables and validation and verification and uncertainty quantification looking at some of the theory behind it and, and introducing the topics. Second volume looks at conjugate heat transfer. And this is, not surprisingly, looking at the interaction between solids and fluids. A key part of the reason for doing analysis in the nuclear industry is to look at the impact of temperatures on, on materials, so the structural integrity and life assessment. Um, and you can't do that without looking at the, the solids as well as the fluid. So it's very much looking at the theory behind conduction, convection, and radiation, how you model it, and the different methods of coupling um, and doing conjugate heat transfer models. So one-way coupling, uh, two-way coupling, or, or things like porous regions and shell conduction. What level of detail do you need? What level of, of analysis do you need for the result that you want to achieve? What is the goal? And what are the challenges you've got in, in this sort of thing? One of the key aspects of, of conjugate heat transfer is the time scales. Um, a lot of the transients associated with conjugate heat transfer take a, a long time, hours, days, to, to occur. Whereas modeling that in a fluid is obviously much harder when, when you're looking at millisecond time scales for fluid fluctuations. We've also got things like surface deposition contact um, and issues like that um, that you need to consider when you're building a model and again we're looking at this in a sort of standard approach so we're looking at the methodologies you can use so an analytical approach system codes and CFD a lot of the focus in these volumes is more on the CFD than the system codes but we do try and bring in uh, a lot of the, the system code analysis, which is done at the moment for reactor design and development and qualification. The third volume is on natural convection and passive cooling. Um, so as I said at the beginning, we're looking at focusing on passive safety arguments. Um, and this includes things like natural circulation during normal operation for reactors like the new scale PWSMR, um, or some of the advanced reactor designs, or passive safety systems when the circulator shuts down. How quickly does the, the natural circulation happen and how strong does it occur? Is it? How much flow do you get around the core and is it sufficient? Can you get the heat out of the reactor? And it's looking at, from a theoretical point of view, in terms of the flow phenomena, so the, the differences between forced, natural, and mixed convection fluid properties and some of the modeling challenges such as the unsteadiness in the flow a lot of natural circulation flow is unsteady so again how do you cope with that transient evolution of the flow and the temperatures and again looking at the methodologies that you use um, as we've mentioned before um, a lot of the, the the focus in the research side is on more detailed modeling such as LES, LES and DNS and we, we've got some of the background and information on that but we've also from an industrial context need to focus on using RANS models um, are they are they good enough how do you validate or demonstrate that they're good enough for your application 
because uh, computationally it, it's still out of industry's grasp to use them in a, in a real uh, reactor design process. Fourth volume, looking at confidence and uncertainty. So again, I think it's been touched on a number of times. It, it's very hard at the moment to use CFD on its own in a, in a nuclear safety case. The level of justification you need and, and how you go about it is, is very prescriptive. Um, so the question is how, to, how do you perform it to the level that you need to? How do you justify what confidence you need? And it's understanding and quantifying those sources. So this is looking at, at uncertainty quantification techniques, but also more detailed sensitivity analysis. Um, is that what you need to do in a particular situation? Or can you do reduced order models or surrogate models to, to run a, a, a detailed CFD model and get the results that you need much quicker so that you can run a whole thousands of different sensitivities? And again, it's looking at the approaches that you can use to develop this confidence and uncertainty, common tools and methods that are out there, um, and how you go about it. Volume five on liquid metal thermal hydraulics. This is very much focusing on, on liquid metals and, and particularly how they differ from the other more common coolants that we use in reactors. So for, for liquid metals, that's mainly around the, the impact of the low Prandtl number. And how does this affect your modeling work? Um, from, from the modeling perspective, it means that your, your momentum boundary layer and your thermal boundary layer no longer are equivalent. And the thermal boundary is much thicker. And that means a lot of your RANS turbulence models and the correlations that have been developed for them are no longer valid and potentially no longer work. So again, how do you deal with them? How can you use existing CFD codes and how do you validate them for it? Um, and a lot of this links to the case studies that, that we'll come on to in terms of some of the validation for liquid metal flows. Finally, looking at the molten salt. So again, this is particularly looking at the differences between molten salts and, some of the, and water or other chemicals. And around molten salt, it's very much around the material properties and physics and chemistry of the salt compositions. Um, these change depending on the, the radionuclides present, the exact salt competition, composition. Um, and so they change depending on, on the age in the reactor, the fuel and, um, and the neutronics involved. And so you need to understand how do you model the heat transfer? How, how sensitive are the results to the, the particular properties in the salt? Um, and radiation becomes important as well because in molten salt it is a it is transparent and so radiation then becomes important and you need to consider it um, and, and look at it as part of the model as i say these technical volumes are, are sort of 80 90 percent complete now and so well under the way um, and over the next three to six months, we're, we're finalizing and, and finishing them off. And so we'll be looking forward to, to make them available to everyone um, in the, the, the cinema, which will be hopefully sort of spring, summer next year uh, and, and letting, getting them to you. I think that's it from me. Um, just about on time from a delay, 15 minute delay perspective. Um, I will now pass on to Gray McPherson who will go through uh, the case studies in a bit more detail um, and look at what we, what case studies we are doing and how they're going to be delivered. Richard, are you up for a question? Yeah, go for it, Mike. Um, well, thanks for that very clear presentation, by the way. Uh, is, it, is, it, is it the intention that these um, documents are, are closed or are they going to be living? That is an interesting question. Um, we are hoping that they will be living. Um, obviously, when our contract ends, we will have no money to update them or, or, or keep them live. But we are hoping that they will be formally published by the IMEC-E, though that, that is still under discussion. 
Um, I don't know if people are aware, but there is a set of technical volumes and case studies on natural hazards that was um, published about a year, two years ago, by led by under the ETI project led by EDF, um, and they are published by the IMEC. Uh, and we're hoping that these can be something similar. So uh, ideally, they will be kept live, and ideally, they will be updated. But that the, the details of how that gets done is is still up for discussion. Thank you. Am I good to go? Can you see my slides? Yes, yeah, we can. Great. Thanks, Richard. So, hello, everybody. I'm Graham. I'm uh, working on the Bayes Style Hydraulics team with Richard and Carol and other people you've probably met before. Um, so, we've got these nice technical volumes that explain how you should do things, um, but everyone likes a worked example. So, what we're going to do, or what we're in the process of doing, is we have four case studies that go through the how and why of choosing a modeling approach. How do you choose what fidelity you need? Why do you choose this kind of model? How did you choose to mesh it in that way? And then explain that decision-making process, explain the uh, process of going through the analysis and also explain how to make that analysis useful at the end because we're doing an analysis in order to support a design or to support a decision or to support a safety case and you need to interpret and present the information in ways that make that um, helpful and valuable which isn't necessarily always automatic it's quite easy to get to the end of the cfd run when it converges and say great job done what's the next one but really it's, there's a lot more after that. Um, we are publishing these documents freely, so they won't contain any real reactor information because we'd get in trouble. Um, so we've been working with reactor developers to come up with um, prototypical and representative reactor designs and conditions and faults and that kind of thing. Um, so they're as real as, as um, we can make them effectively. So that makes them applicable to, to, um, to industry. Um, each of the four case studies, so there's one relating to tall 3D, one relating to a molten salt reactor, one relating to a lead cooled fast reactor, and one relating to an SMR. I'll go through each one in a second. And what we're intending to do is this matrix approach of, of saying, well, some content from each of these volumes is going to be demonst demonstrated in each of these case studies. So not every case study is demonstrating everything, but uh, across, the, um, across the suite of four of them, we should be trying to demonstrate a large proportion of how you would apply the information that's in the technical volumes. I'm going to go through these one at a time. Um, the TOL 3D is an experiment at KTH that was produced data under the recent Sesame project, and it has a, a 3D chamber, um, hence the name in the title, where you have a heater, and lead comes in, and lead goes around this plate at the end, and you can either have a forced flow situation or a natural circulation situation where you have stratification. And the intention was this of this, it was to make it highly instrumented so it would produce a uh, data that could be used to compare to CFD codes. Now, the, the, we, throughout all of my slides, you need to be thinking to yourself, if I was an engineer who was two years out of university and I wanted to get, I'd been asked to get into this industry, how would I, how would I go about doing a good job? So the first thing you would do is you wouldn't start with a complicated geometry, you'd start with a simple geometry, and that's what we did too. Um, so we had a simple channel flow that we did some RANDs and some LES and, and compared to some available DNS data in order to make sure that we knew how to do the basics. We could load up Fluent and stick in some lead and make sure it did, um, it did what you expected it to. This also gives us a nice link to um, the work happening at Sheffield under liquid metal, the liquid metal heading, um, because they're looking at, at the same geometry. And um, so it allows us to take benefit um, from what they're doing too. So there are two, as I said, there are two conditions. There's a, there's a forced convection and a natural convection condition. And what we've done is we've gone through a sequence of saying, well, what's the best I can do? Well, probably the best I can do is LES in 3D. But then say, well, how good is unsteady rounds? How good is steady rounds? Do I really need to be in 3D? Can I be in 2D axis symmetric? And looking at the, comparing that to the experimental results each time and saying, and, and explaining to, to the reader, what, what do you lose at each stage? Every time you make an approximation or an assumption or a reduction in, in fidelity, what do you lose? So I'm going to take these bullet points on the next slide and show you some, some results. So this is from LES. We have a nice jet impacting on the plate. And we have the temperature field here where you can see the heaters and you've got heat passed through the insulation and you have some 
specific profile within the in the liquid metal itself. And what we found is that actually for force convection, the jet doesn't seem to sit still, it wanders about. So it's not stable and instantaneously symmetric. And that involved, that makes comparing to the data a bit different, a, a bit difficult. But for natural convection, the jet is stable. So can we be 2D or can we be 3D? It depends on the flow um, at, at any one time. So for the natural convection case, steady runs and 2D axisymmetric is, is, it appears adequate. What we also found is it's very difficult to get detailed heat balance with this um, experiment uh, because it's done at such high temperature and it's hard to line things up. So it's a good, it's a good um, worked example of the difficulties of detailed comparison to experimental results. Next case study is to do with um, a molten salt reactor where one of the problems with salts is that people don't really know their properties all that well um, or they know them for other salts that aren't quite the final application ones because the final application might be full of actinides or plutonium or whatever. Um, their transparency to infrared and that transparency varies with composition so if you get corrosion, if you get fission products the transparency changes so you don't really know what the transparency is necessarily going to be. And what the purpose of this case study is to say, well, okay, I've got this system that I don't know very well, but uh, what I'm going to do is I want to do some CFD of a fuel assembly with it to try and derive a lower order model, a porous model. And the reason I've got these handwritten sketches up here, this is, this is how I went about the process of thinking to myself. Do I need a sixth of this hexagon of the, of the whole assembly or can I get away with a single pin gap, which is what's down here? Do I need the whole thing or not? Do I need the full length of the assembly? Do I need to put in the inlet and outlet nozzles and, and the support structures? Um, when I've got hexagonal fuel, it's got wrappers, it's got interwrapper flow. How do I deal with interwrapper flow? How do I deal with the fact that this is Moltex is designed with liquid metal fuel inside pins? It's going to circulate itself with the heat generating fluid. How do I deal with that? Now that, that process I had to go through partly because I'm going to have to explain it to a reader. Um, so it was, it was a useful thought process of saying what the options are and what you would select and why. And there's a lot of commonality with the case you'll see later on, which is the, um, the lead code fast reactor, where I'm trying to figure out here what, how you would represent fuel in a porous um, medium representation and what do I need to do with my full scale CFD to, um, to, to derive that. So I'm also going to do a couple of, um, a couple of conditions. I'm going to do force flow through the coolant and lower uh, speed um, natural circulation flow rates and I'm going to work out pressure drop and heat transfer, uh, porous medium representations from it. But to start with, the, the one of the unique things about Moltex's design is this um, uh, closed pin with circulating fuel in it. And I found that there's some data actually from late 60s, published in 1970, of um, water with a heat source in it. So laminar flow, and I've managed, I did a precursor simulation to say how good does my mesh need to be. So these are non-dimensionalized velocity and temperature profiles compared to experimental data for a closed tube with this heat generating fluid. I think people gave up on heat generating fluid experiments around about then because um, it seemed like the applications weren't necessarily going anywhere until about now. What we're going to do then is take um, the model, the CFD model I developed for fuel assembly and run it through Dakota. So I want to do uncertainty analysis, sorry, sensitivity analysis and uncertainty quantification, not just ad hoc as we normally do it, but using some of the um, powerful statistical tools that Dakota gives us for free. So Dakota's um, from Sandia in the States and is open source. And the question is, how do I take a small number of expensive CFD runs and understand what variation in fluid properties means. So when I say sm small number, I mean dozens, not hundreds. And if I permute my fluid properties, how can I work out what the uncertainty in my answer is going to be? Um, the third case study is looking at reactor scale. So um, working with uh, Westinghouse, we are looking at a sixth model of um, pool type uh, lead cooled fast reactor. And we are going to um, look at a natural circulation decay heat removal transient with um, simplified pragmatic engineering CFD methods. So we know for sure that we're not going to get the details of this case right, but we're just trying to uh, shine a bit more light, add a bit more insight compared to what you'd get from a system code. So normally you would evaluate these faults in a system code model, but you're not going to get any real insight into stratification or localized temperature profiles of the vessel. So we're going to use conjugate heat transfer and porous medium and, and radiation in the gap between vessels and things to try and get a better understanding of how this is going to work. 
and we're making good progress with that. We built our sixth model and we developed our porous representations for fuel, pump, um, heat exchanger, and the um, interwrapper gaps. And we're currently getting that up and running and solving. The last case study is one that's a fairly familiar topic in PWRs where you have a safety injection, a cold leg safety injection following a small brake lockup wraps. This is using the um, ROSA uh, LSTF uh, data that's available from the NEA. And we're going to model this in both CFD and the system code. So we're going to use trace. And what we're going to do is show how you can go from system code level representation of the fault into a detail, a more detailed localized CFD representation of the localized flow. And the objective is to look at um, the structural integrity drivers. So look at what effect does this flow have on the metal temperatures nearby. So if we're saying that's the RPV nozzle on this PWR, then we don't want to break that. So we're looking at um, the structural integrity aspects. So what it's doing is showing the, showing the reader, how do I go from a high level, low fidelity representation system code, and then take in boundary conditions, do a more, a more detailed analysis, and then transfer something back, either a correlation or temperatures or that kind of thing. And in terms of getting on with that, we have um, run the model with the injection data coming from uh, the test data. And this has been done before. This we're not saying this is new. People have looked at Rosa in, in the past and done this kind of, this kind of thing. But what we're doing is we're stepping through the process in as an educational manner as we can to demonstrate the, 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 the methods. We have our trace model here of the whole system. And the thing that I think we are doing that's new is we're doing conjugate heat transfer of the solids as well. So we're representing the solid lumps of, of metal in the experiment. And we're going to look at temperature profiles in the metal uh, because in our conjugate heat transfer technical volume, we have a section that says, what information does my thermal hydraulic analysis need to provide the structural engineer in order for them to make uh, an integrity or a fatigue assessment? So you may have noticed um, that there are two, there's not, these kind of, these case studies aren't the same thing. Two of them are, are to do with times when we've got data, we've got data from an experiment and we can compare to that. And people have looked at tall 3D and safety injections before. So if you, were a, if you were a user of this information, you would be able to compare to these previous simulations on this experimental data and come up with an answer that you could probably put a fair bit of trust in because you can compare it to other things. The molten salt and the lead fast reactor models are a bit more speculative because there aren't any operating prototypes or integral effects tests that you can compare to but it doesn't mean you shouldn't try and do some analysis. So though, what we're saying is we're going to use the best information we have and some prag and make pragmatic process towards making a design decision or um, an optimization. But, but you have to acknowledge that there will be a greater level of unknown and uncertainties remaining in this kind of analysis than the first kind of analysis. The other thing that's quite nice that emerged actually quite naturally was that we have a th the first three case studies form a sequence. So if you were new in this domain and you wanted to model a whole reactor scale metal cool uh, liquid metal cooled fast reactor you could follow these three because tall 3d tells you how to do liquid metal stuff at all it allows you to figure out which um, rand's model might work best and um and what validation evidence you can assemble the next one albeit in salt tells you about how to work with fuel assemblies and how to go from detailed um component level cfd to extract reduced order models of in a porous representation, understand what uncertainty is in them, and then you use the information you learn there to put it into your whole reactor model where you've got several complex parts and the fuel is one of them, and you can use that fuel model you've derived to try and answer a whole reactor type um, model. Um, just because Elia brought it up, I thought I'd include a slide as well on the um, FSI benchmarks. This isn't a case study, this is just another activity that we're doing. Um, and uh, the reason it's part of the Bayes project is because it falls under the, the collaboration between Elia and ourselves is under the auspices of the US-UK action plan. So um, other colleagues uh, Elia has at Argonne, Lawrence Livermore as well are, are part of this. Um, so really the whole point of doing this work is so we talk to each other across the Atlantic, not necessarily just because we do the CFD, but that's a, a good thing as well. So this is the, the experimental rig. It's got two vertical cylinders. 
here's this frequency response of them, here's a mesh, here's some, here's some flow. So we're in the process of doing that at the moment. And while Ellie is doing LES, uh, we are going to do URANs, not because we can't do LES, but for you, we want to see, well, okay, what does URANs give you in this situation? And also there's options around, do you do one-way coupling or two-way coupling for your structural feedback? Some of the cases are in lock-in, some of them aren't. So it's an interesting, difficult problem. And this is the work of lots of people that I'm taking credit for. Um, so there's about 10 members of Fraser Nash staff currently working on case studies. And we've got to thank our colleagues at KTH uh, for helping us with Tall3D, Pavel and Dimitri, Adam uh, for helping us with give data from Multex with the MSR case study, Paolo and Millerad from Westinghouse on the LFR, Scott from the Rolls-Royce SMR team for helping us out with the um, safety injection and the Rosa work. And also thanks to Elia and um, Jerome and Landon uh, on the FSI work. And that's me. Excellent. Thanks, Graham. This is where you tell me any... I was on mute the whole time. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Graham before we move on to the, the, the first of the research presentations by Dean? Hi, Graham. It's Steve Graham here from NNL. Thank you for that very um, informative presentation of the case studies uh, that you've got as part of this project. Uh, the reactor case that you were looking at there um, is incredibly complicated in terms of simplification of the phenomena that you need to actually uh, do in order to get a representative simulation. Um, you know, we spend our years trying to trying to do this um, and you, you seem to infer that a new user could pick it up and simply walk through the, um, the, the cases or, or the steps that you suggested and come out the other end with a, you know, with a representative simulation. So what I'm asking is, are there any health warnings associated with this particular study because you probably need them pages and pages use, of them did you yeah use absolutely them? You have to be aware of it yeah part of the process part of the the, the knack of the that we're going to try and describe is what you shouldn't use these models for even if they look like they could do them so that yeah. model is for decay heat removal so it has no heat exchanger components really it doesn't have a pump component um the we're not doing the trip simulation with it so for example if you wanted to run it at steady state under operating conditions and then trip the reactor and then see what that transient does we're not saying you could necessarily do that so the geometry looks like you could do it and with additional modeling work you maybe make could make it do it so yeah that 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 is probably the simplest representation of a reactor scale model that you could get away with that shows you how to get up to that scale and yes, it, we acknowledge that it's reasonably ambitious and we acknowledge that some aspects of it will be wrong. But I think we need to have that as an ambition of saying, you know, we, we, we should be trying to figure out ways of doing, going beyond system codes. So it's easy to go beyond a system code in a fuel channel with, your, with, with an assembly. You, you, you largely just add more mesh until the, until the physics are right. But for a whole system like that, it will always need pragmatic engineering judgments to say, well, okay, let's just approximate it like this, or let's ignore that Absolutely. for now. But trying yeah. to remember them and make sure that when, you make, when you're trying to make a decision about whether you build it or if it's that shape, or you try and explain it to a regulator that you, you remember you made those approximations. No, thanks. So, uh, Graham, I take it that all of this stuff is going to be published, the, those benchmarks, as part of the suite of documents uh, that uh, Richard introduced. Uh, you, you mentioned also at the end of your presentation there the FSI work that you've been doing, which is not part of this particular project. Is the, is the intention to make that uh, publicly available through some other uh, documentation? That information will become available through the publication by the CSNI. Um, so I don't think we will be allowed to release it publicly while that benchmark process is underway. But there's the CFD for NRS conference uh, in November where people will give update presentations on what they're doing. So that information will be published, but not necessarily by us. So our output from that will be our submission of our data for the open and closed benchmarks and perhaps a, a brief um, accompanying document that will go into the um, the CSNI CFD task group process and will be published at a certain point. So you, mean you, you can compare it to the, the other benchmark documents that are out there like the T-junction or the um, or other ones. They'll take a while. They'll take, they'll take longer than the project. I reckon they'll probably be a year before you, you see them. Um, is it because you wanted to see it soon or is it you just wanted to make sure you could see it eventually? 
I, I'm just as a general point of interest um, you know FSI is something that we get asked about from time to time so uh, any, any opportunity we have to to see what what's best practice and further our understanding in that in that field is is uh, something that we look to seek seek out yeah you should see a dozen set per set of participants um, efforts uh, or with a range of different codes and modeling approaches and you should be able to see what works and what doesn't against some fairly high fidelity experimental data so when that information is published it should be a good resource for that super thank you excellent thanks graham um i think if we leave it there for questions and if anyone's got any other questions we'll, we'll we can deal with them at the end dean are you ready to start your Hello. presentation uh, yes, yes, I'll just share the screen. And Brilliant, thank you. Oh, uh, oh, hello? That's just, oh, there we go. That's it. Okay. Oh, right, yeah, it's just there. Yeah, so um, good afternoon. Hello. Um, I'm. Uh, Any chance Dean we Wilson? can see you, Dean? Any chance you can see me? Yeah. <laughs> um, you didn't have to see me, Mike. I know, I know what you look like. <laughs> um, sure. How about that? Thank you. No problem. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, Dean Wilson, Firm for Research Group of the University of Manchester. And I'm just going to give a update on the, uh, as Richard inter introduced, the um, natural circulation and passive cooling research element of the uh, Bailey's Reactor Design uh, Project. So, if I can work out how to get on the next slide, there we go. Uh, so just as a brief overview, just going to give a quick introduction to natural circulation, passive cooling, discuss uh, CFD and the aims and objectives of our, of our project. And then we're going to look at uh, uh, some results of a, of a kind of loop literature survey we did. And then two loops that we selected from that survey, which we've done some uh, computational work on. And we'll look at some comparisons with the experimental data and, um, and summary and steps forward. So for those who may be unfamiliar with natural circulation loops, it's just a quick introduction and, um, to them and how they're used for passive cooling. So at its simplest, uh, a natural circulation loop is just a closed circuit containing both source and sink of thermal energy. And if I just get a pointer, uh, by separating them with, it, with an elevation difference, uh, we can actually exploit that resulting buoyancy force to drive the fluid around the loop. So from that schematic on the right, you should be able to see how the heat is going to uh, increase the, uh, sorry, decrease the density in the left leg while the cooler will increase density in the right leg and you're going to get uh, fluid motion in the clockwise direction uh, there. So a key attribute of this particular setup is that that flow can transport heat without the use of any powered devices pumps or, or, or if possible human even human intervention at all so that obviously makes it quite an attractive system um, for, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a passive uh, system. A real world example at the bottom there is just a, um, a schematic of the passive heat removal system of the AP1000 VWR and you can see that you've essentially got a T off the hot leg that goes up into the water tank that's in there at the roof of the, of the building and then the cooler water returns into the uh, into the cold leg and um, that can then uh, recirculate um, under the power of just the, the decay heat from the um, from the core. So despite being quite conceptually simple, uh, the flows they produce are actually highly susceptible to instabilities and that mostly results from the tightly coupled nature of the thermal and the dynamic fields. Um, and that kind of wide range of possible flows means that actually designing, optimizing and substantiating these systems can actually be quite, um, quite difficult. Historically, uh, the reliance has been on the kind of system codes as the principal numerical methodology, but it's well known that they just don't have the fidelity to reproduce the kind of complex flow patterns that uh, natural convection is well known to, to produce. Um, CFD can provide that fidelity and uh, is becoming cheaper as computational power increases. Um, so that's kind of where we're gonna look at see it, um, how they can perform in reproducing some of these NCL uh, flows. There's an illustration on the right-hand side, that's two plots. Uh, from one of the experiments we've picked up. This is the uh, an L2 loop experiment at the University of Genoa in Italy. And what that plot shows is the temperature drop across the heater in time for different heat sink temperatures. 
and the bottom is an attempt at a relapse calculation from that that was published by the IAEA in 2014. And um, without too much inspection, you can see that actually the, the relap had a quite a difficult time in reproducing lots of the flow features that the, that the experiment um, predicted. Of course, we're not saying that CFD is going to entirely replace these from codes, of course, but there should be some synergy uh, between them. So our research objectives basically build upon the need to advance our understanding of these flows in, in loops. And we're going to assess how current CFD models perform, areas where, where they might be improved, and how they can be used to assess the effectiveness of, 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 of these uh, loop systems. Um, so a number of aims fit within that. Uh, we've got broad literature survey, basically to see the general trends seen in steady state, um, both steady state and stability behavior of, of loops. Now uh, that's kind of see where we currently are. Um, and then hopefully from that identify some, some loops which have sufficient data and exhibit a good enough range of dynamic behavior to warrant some reproduction with uh, CFD. And on those loops, we aim to basically explore and assess a number of potential advances in um, point phenomena prediction, both both well used models and some of the more advanced ones that, that might be less well used in, um, in industry. And we're kind of essentially asking how good is the current state of the art CFD approach to predicting these flows and where might be the best place we can focus uh, our resources for uh, further development. So just a brief slide, one slide overview of the outcomes of the loop survey. So a big um, outcome of the phase one program was that there was quite a big lack of CFD grade experimental data on, uh, on loops. And um, this extended survey here is, is largely reaffirmed that. Um, so we covered quite a lot of systems across uh, both experimental research loops, the kind of things you might um, see most academic institutions doing, large scale integral test facilities and, uh, and uh, reactor systems. Um, there's a couple of, you know, the, the, the wide range of the two extremes of almost complexity on the right hand side there. So ranging from a simple toroidal loop at the top to, um, to the, the, the Rosa large scale test facility, which is some natural circulation tests as well. Um, the two main takeaway really is that we did pick up two loops, which we identified for further study. Don't really provide CFD grade data, um, but, but have, have enough to, to, to allow us to, to make some comparisons. And, and that is really the, the, the big takeaway is that there, are, there isn't any current facilities that we could find that we knew, we, we knew about that did measure kind of what we'd like to see uh, for, for CFD validation purposes. Um, and this study we do in this kind of survey, we do intend to write up in some form for, for for, for publishing. Um, so onto the first loop that we uh, picked up, and this is from the BARC in India. It's a water field loop, and it's about two meters tall, about one and a half meters wide. Uh, diameter is about 26, uh, 27 millimeters. And an interesting feature of this setup is it actually contains two heaters, as you can see, and two coolers. And that allows for four possible different uh, heating configurations. Um, in all cases, the, the heater that's active provides a uniform heat flux, basically an electrical uh, wrap around the outside, and the cooler provides a uniform temperature via a um, usually a coaxial heat exchanger, the water jacket. And you can probably see how these different configurations will, will, will inherently provide different kind of stability characteristics for a, uh, for a loop. And the experimental data, they performed a, a range of tests going from uh, steady state tests, uh, some transients. So how, looking up how the flow starts from, from a stagnant condition and also some stability tests going, raising power, raising from steady state and uh, step back from um, um, power decay. So this slide is just basically a quick overview of the stability tests that they've conducted for each configuration, just to give you a picture of what they kind of, uh, are found. Um, the heating configurations are referred to in terms of these acronyms commonly, but I've added these diagrams as, as uh, I still have trouble visualizing what the acronyms are. Um, so hopefully those diagrams help. And the powers in the rows here, this is the power range of the experiment from, from, from about 50 watts down to a kilowatt. These aren't individual cases that they solve, but rather it's just representative. So the experiment actually worked in nominal steps of 50 watts going up from, from 50 all the way up to 100. And the runs were in fact sequential. So they went up and basically they went up from 100 watts to a kilowatt in steps of 100 watts, then backed off 50 watts, and then went down in steps of 100 watts. So they went right up and, and, and right down. 
And you can see from just this overview that, that these two configurations with the vertical heaters were, were stable across the whole range of powers considered. And the two that had the horizontal heater, perhaps not, as, uh, not that surprising, were um, only stable for, for very low powers. And uh, we actually find it a bit surprising that they even got stable cases for the, for the very low powers um, in this horizontal heater, horizontal cooler uh, configurations. So we've looked at basically reproducing a selection across the whole range of cases um, considered, um, including a few outside of the stable region, just to check that we do correctly capture where that stability boundary boundary would lie. Um, there isn't enough time for me to cover them all uh, here, of course, so I'm going to focus on just these two configurations uh, here. So just a brief slide on the kind of modelling framework which we're using. So these are transient simulations under the URAMS framework. So although they are, uh, the, the loop should reach a steady state, we are actually solving them as transient to capture that development. And um, the first set of runs we're going to do, um, we actually do something different from the experiment. So we actually initially started all the runs from stagnant conditions. Um, and this was partly to check whether hysteresis effects were actually important. Um, and also to capture that initial behavior from, from the stagnant condition. We do, we, we have done some sequential runs and we do plan to do, 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 do lots more as well to check how that flow, um, how the uh, initial conditions affect the results. And we have actually got some cases I'll show that, that, that highlight that. Um, for turbulence, most early cases we run just use a Lawn de Charme EVM with a simple gradient diffusion um, turbulent heat flux model. Um, low Reynolds numbers approach for the near wall flow. It's well known that um, standard wall functions aren't applicable for kind of natural uh, convection type flows. Um, and the, some of these cases are quite low power, and as, as you might know, that natural circu circulation can, can lead to quite low flow rates. Um, so we don't expect really the turbulence to be sustained in, in some of the lower power cases. Um, conjugate heat transfer is applied for all of these cases, so the walls of the pipe are included. And the typical meshes you can see on the right-hand side with an upper left elbow there and a typical cross-section. Um, meshes range from about 500,000, so some of the lower power ones to up to about 2.6 million for the, for the higher ones. So a quick overview of the uh, steady state cases. So we can compare the resultant flow conditions non-dimensionally on a plot like this. So this compares the steady state Reynolds number here as an output with the modified Grashof number along the uh, X axis as an input. So this modified Grashof number here is just an outcome of non-dimensionalization performed by Vijay and his group at VARC. And most of the symbols here you recognize, it's not too dissimilar from a Grashof number you might recognize, except that we have a heater power in here and we have this delta ZC, which is the elevation difference between the heater and the cooler. NG is this parameter which non-dimensionalizes the length of the loop. And Vijayan found that by combining them in such a way that he was able to produce such a plot like um, this. So these correlations on here, laminar transition and turbulent, the laminar and turbulent ones are a direct result of this non-dimensionalization. The transition one is actually an empirical one, which, uh, which we picked up as well, which kind of neatly frames the two um, together. Uh, the Reynolds number itself is usually to turn, to, to find in terms of mass flow rate. And that mass flow rate, of course, is actually quite difficult to measure in a loop. And so most don't provide direct measurements of them because it's obviously quite invasive. So um, it's usually measured in terms of this, applying this energy balance over a heated section. So here you've got the heat, the, the heat to power and the temperature drop across the, um, the heater. So each point on here is experimental result resembling different configuration, but you can see that they basically all provide pretty much lie along the same kind of line that all in agreement with the correlations. And typically as the power increases on here, you tend to find yourself traveling up the line. Not too much difference between the configurations, but that's partly through the design of this non-dimensionalization uh, as well. So clearly where our simulations lie on this plot is of interest. So onto our first set of results. And this is the same shot plot as shown previously, but with the vertical heater, vertical cooler configuration only. And our CFD results are the colored symbols. Um, where we've not solved all of the cases, but a representation across, the, across them. And um, to be consistent with the experiment, the mass flow rate is computed as per the experiment. So we also apply an energy balance. These are transient cases. And we basically wait for that transient to, to disappear once the flow becomes steady, if it does then we kind of take an average uh, from there. Um, and you can see we get pretty good agreement with the correlations. And the, um, 
we're well within the spread of experimental data and we agree quite well with, within, the, within the correlations there. Um, you will notice that, um, and obviously increasing as the power increases, we capture the same trend as well. You'll notice that there's two points here, both at the same power. And um, this circular one is actually uh, a case that started from the results of the higher power case there. And um, we're going to take a closer look at those and some, and some time histories because they revealed something uh, quite interesting. So this is time history of those cases. Um, and at the top, that's the mass flow rate in time. And at the bottom, this is the ratio of the cooler power to the heater power. So the heater power is fixed, but the cooler power, of course, depends upon the flow rate. And the system will tend towards thermal equilibrium. And once it does, you will expect that to hit ratio of, of, of one. And you can see that happening uh, there. These simulations have gone on for much longer than this. This is only about a third of what's actually been simulated. But uh, put too much on the plot, you won't see the, you won't see the development. Um, so this is 805 watts and you can see that you get an initial pulse followed by some smaller pulsations before the flow gradually kind of separate uh, steadies out into this stable pattern it's not it's not entirely steady state it, there is some minor variations but this is statistically uh, steady for the higher power however and, and this pattern was common for lots of the lower powers as well the same kind of flow development at the higher power, however, we noticed that actually something different happened around I don't know, 750 seconds there. We saw this steady increase in mass flow rate until it actually then reached a, a steady state that's actually quite a bit higher um, than what you would have expected. I mean, I haven't shown them but from the previous trend, you wouldn't have expected it to be that high. And what actually caused this increase is actually um, a steady increase in turbulence within the flow. And so what we found is most of the lower power cases, although we initialized with some turbulence, um, it dies out pretty quickly. And here there was sufficient residual levels at a higher power to, uh, to enable production mechanisms to kick in. And um, physically what's going on is the, the effect of turbulence on the heat transfer. So it increases the heat transfer uh, coefficient in the cooler and that reduces the temperature difference between the fluid in the cooler and the cooler wall and effectively lowers the average temperature in that, in that leg along the right hand side. And the greater the temperature difference between these two legs on average, the greater your driving buoyancy force. So we actually get a higher buoyancy force and therefore a higher uh, flow rate. So it became clear really that sustaining turbulence in these loops and being able to actually represent it when it should be there is going to be quite uh, a challenge. So that's why we then sequentially step back the power. So this is later on in that simulation. You can see by the time when we step back the power, you can see a sudden dip and it does then stabilize. And you can see that it stabilizes at a level far higher than than what it did when it was uh, laminar. Um, so obviously capturing that behavior is going to be, going to be interesting. Uh, so we're gonna continue to step down the powers and see, um, see how this plot looks as we go back down. You can see on the logarithmic scale, it doesn't appear as too much of a difference. The next uh, set of results we're gonna look at is for a uh, horizontal, heat, horizontal heater and vertical cooler configuration, where again, we get pretty good agreement between the correlations and experimental results, again, correct, capturing the correct uh, trend. Um, the flow does laminarize as before. Um, as I said, we're gonna try and explore ways of either adding or sustaining that turbulence. Um, we're also currently running cases outside of this range to check that that does, as the experiment did, pick up unstable flow. So we're gonna have a quick look at some of the time histories for these two cases as well. Mass flow rate again at the top. You can see there's a slight different behavior. We initially get a flow reversal. So negative mass flow rate here is an anti-clockwise behavior. And you initially get a period at the start where you um, don't get any flow at all. And that's because this heat is generating lots of, lots of fluid, but it has to travel left and right. And until the hot fluid enters the, either of those legs, you won't get any motion. In all cases, it went anti-clockwise, but then reversed. And then this pulsation has kind of died out eventually. But you can see they grow in amplitude as the power increases. So there's clearly um, you can see how at higher powers it's very likely that this, this might either culminate in another reversal and uh, rather than decay as it um, has, does here. So we're also looking at that in more detail as well. This final uh, compar comparison for this uh, loop is actually some pressure drop measurements along the horizontal uh, heater. So this is pressure drop along the horizontal heater for three different powers. This is part of the flow initialization test that they did. Um, the experimental was considerable uncertainty. These experimental values are plotted here because they were digitized from a very poor graph. Um, so I've kind of made the line a bit fat and a bit 
bit see-through to kind of highlight that but but you can see we're actually capturing pretty much the same trend with time scales a little bit off but, but we're quite pleased that we actually especially captured the the addition the point at which it reversed here um so um so yeah we do do capture somewhat the um the, the flow development obviously the pressure drop across the heat is just indication of of what the flow is doing whether it's going left or right um, I'll just, I'm conscious I'm running out of time, so I'll just quickly go through the other loop. Um, so this is a, 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 an L2 loop, which is based at the um, Dying Technology University of Genoa. It's a bit smaller, it's about one by one meters, but similar diameter, horizontal heater and horizontal cooler. So expect that to be an unstable, an unstable scenario. And they conducted a variety of experimental campaigns, varied power, heating temperature as well, and actually loop inclination. Uh, which was intriguing. Um, we've only stuck with the vertical loop and there was some system codes analysis done by the IA which I showed on the previous um, slide. So again a, a quick overview of the stability, it's a little bit busy this slide, sorry. Um, the, the two sets of data were published in 2008 and 2017 and they looked at a very variety of powers and heatsink temperatures, notably the kind of quite cold heatsink temperatures there. Um, mostly unstable flow, some stable cases, uh, this set of data down the bottom is actually data we've actually the group have been kind enough to share with us. So we have a full time history of lots of measurements there. And what we've done with this one is we've used, we're planning on conducting quite a range of simulations on them, but we've initially looked at a, a lower power, lower heat sink one just to play around with and look at sensitivity to a number of factors, but also um, look at some of these higher power cases uh, that produce turbulent flow. Um, I'm going to briefly skip through the, the, the wall thickness one, but basically this slide just shows the influence of wall thickness is one of the sensitivity studies we did. So we looked at um, two different codes, satin and fluent, and this is the mass flow rate, and we go down in from two millimetre thickness, which is, is what we weren't quite sure of the thickness of the experiment at the start. So we did two millimetres, one millimetre, which is actually what the experiment is, and then zero is in no conjugate heat transfer. So you can see that the, the addition of the, the wall, the thicker wall is a somewhat stabilizing but actually there's not an awful lot of difference between one and um, and zero and finally just a direct comparison between one of the turbulent cases so a higher power much higher power at eight degrees and this is the pressure drop across the heater again and you're comparing the CFD on the left with the experiment on the right this is the temperature drop across the heater on the bottom you can see that actually CFD is picking up that that qualitative behavior quite well this kind of pulsations that gradually grow and then culminate in a reversal and um, so we're quite pleased that that captures that. And this is obviously continuing. So it would be interesting to see uh, what goes on uh, beyond, um, beyond that. So that's just a quick um, summary of, of what we've been going on at the moment. Um, this is ongoing work, of course. I've only been able to report a subset of the cases. And um, lots of the further runs we do, we'll explore different terminal modeling approaches, some of the even more advanced models to see if there is any influence of that at all. And um, we've also got some Fraser Nash are conducting some system codes analysis for us as well for one of the DRC loops. So that'll provide an additional dimension to compare our CFD with and the experiment together. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Excellent, thanks Dean. Um, where we are slipping a bit on time, um, yeah, but if, if there's sort of what, yeah, no, it's partly my fault as well and so uh, sort of uh, adding up. Um, if there's sort of one question before we go into the break, that people want to ask. Can I ask a question, Dean? So you, sure. you called the title "Natural Convection and Passive Cooling." Uh, circulation, um, I think. But yeah. Yeah, natural circulation, passive cooling, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. Did, did you, when do you get a flow around the loop? Mm -hmm. So that's almost like a force convection driven by the natural convection. Does the heat transfer look like a force convection? Um, it. I, <laughs> If you considered, I mean, we, t we tend, we don't really, I, can, I, can, I know what you mean. I mean, the system as a whole is, is entirely driven by natural convection, of course. Um, but if you considered a small pipe in isolation in some areas on the taller loop, yes. Um, but you tend to get some features around the corner which develop. So the, uh, the, it, it's not quite as straight, as simple as a force convection flow in a pipe. But, um, but yeah, there are elements of that in there. Um, but it's important to emphasize it isn't it isn't a force convection or mixed convection flow um, it's entirely linked and that's the partly where the instability arises thank you excellent thank you um i think according to the the timetable there's a, a 10 minute break now um so if if you want to go and grab a, a cup of tea and um 
Or whatever. Then if we want to restart at ten past three, um, and we can move on to the the remaining research um, areas. Thank you very much. Okay, well we'll see everyone in in ten minutes.
Hello. Hopefully, um, everyone's had a nice break and uh, ready to get to get going again. Um, Bo, are you online and ready to start uh, your yes. presentation? Yes, I'm ready. I uh, just need to share my uh, screen. Um, Excellent. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so this presentation is based on one of the R&D uh, package in the base digital reactor thermal hydraulics project. And the, uh, the title is Subchannel CFD for uh, nuclear fuel bundles. Uh, I'm Bo Liu uh, from University of Sheffield. Uh, so here is the outline of this presentation, uh, including basically uh, five sections, uh, the background introduction, uh, 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 an overview of the baseline subchannel CFD and uh, some uh, newly developed functionality of the subchannel CFD, uh, including the coupling with uh, resolved CFD and the coupling with the process media uh, method. Uh, so the last uh, section is summary. Um, so first, uh, let's uh, come to the background. So there is a clear trend that uh, the reactor design and uh, safety assessment have put forward uh, increasing uh, challenge requirements for the nuclear thermal hydraulics modeling, uh, which, however, uh, still largely relies on the traditional subchannel and system codes, uh, so especially in industry. Uh, so the traditional methods become more and more insufficient. For example, they perform not well uh, in simulating uh, trending flows uh, and uh, uh, so strong uh, so 3D phenomena. So, uh, so, in, uh, 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 so in contrast, uh, so CFD is a, a more advanced method because it is based on a more general uh, first principle uh, physical laws. And in the last uh, few decades, uh, great advancement uh, have been achieved in CFD and related uh, HPC techniques, uh, but it is uh, still not feasible to uh, use CFD routinely. Uh, in engineering simulations due to the high computing cost. So here is uh, 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 so a pyramid chart uh, showing the hierarchy of the uh, current thermal fluid modeling tools. So the situation is that, uh, so the advanced method often have a lower uh, favorability uh, in the industry and vice versa. So there is a various gap uh, lying uh, so between uh, the, uh, the CFD and the traditional tools. And this is the reason why many researchers are focused on developing the intermediate uh, method to bridge the gap. And the subchannel CFD also belongs to this large category of methods. And here I also listed some uh, similar methods uh, that have already been available in the open literature. Um, so subchannel CFD is in nature a hybrid of a CFD and a traditional subchannel code. So it is based on a standard uh, CFD solver with a full set of three-dimensional governing equations solved and the subchannel correlations used for the closure modeling. Uh, and the dual mesh, uh, dual solution uh, uh, so technique is used, uh, so including a cost grade computing mesh on which uh, the invasive flow is resolved with corrections for diffusion and the turbine mixing. And the filtering mesh, uh, which is exactly the same as that used uh, in a typical subchannel code to allow the, uh, the subchannel correlations to be used for the closure modeling. Uh, one of the most important features of subchannel CFD is that uh, correlations are durable uh, or calibratable according to the specific designs of reactors. Uh, so which uh, helps to achieve better performance of it and uh, reduce the uncertainties in practical applications. Um, so, the, uh, uh, so the vision of this development include uh, three uh, uh, so stages. So in uh, stage one, uh, it is essentially aimed at achieving the capability of providing uh, CFD-like uh, 3D results with a significant reduction in computing cost compared to the conventional CFD, and the feasibility for modeling large size reactor components or even the subsystems. Uh, in stage two, uh, we focus on further uh, expanding its capability for off-design conditions, particularly 
uh, through the coupling uh, with resolved CFD and the cross media approach. Uh, the ultimate goal of this development is to use this tool to replace the traditional 1D uh, tools. Um, so, uh, so in the future, uh, uh, so modeling of a large reactor component or a reactor core uh, using this method could include a background subchannel CFD model and several uh, resolved sum models to refine the simulation for the regions where the detailed flow of interest. Uh, and also, uh, we can embed uh, process media as models uh, within the subchannel background model to simplify the regions where the details have no particular interest. Um, so uh, in this section, uh, I will first uh, briefly uh, go through some key points of the theory and then uh, move on to some case studies of, this, uh, of testing this method. Uh, so as uh, mentioned in the previous uh, slides, uh, we solve a full set of three-dimensional governing equations on a cost grid, which uh, captures the main geometry in a few bundle. Uh, so for example, the few rods. So the computing mesh is generally uh, look like, uh, looks like this. Uh, and the simple turbulence model uh, is used to account for a correct level of mixing in the core flow region. And the flow is averaged over uh, a filtering mesh, uh, which is shown here using uh, the yellow lines, uh, so that the correlations can be used uh, to further calculate the subchannel wall shear and heat fluxes, uh, which will be then imposed as boundary conditions in form of source terms at the wall neighboring cells in the computing mesh. Um, so, uh, 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 so subchannel CFD has been uh, uh, so currently implemented in the open source code uh, CoSatin. Uh, so all of the uh, tests uh, were uh, so carried out using uh, CoSatin uh, in the rest of the presentation. Um, so the first case study is very simple. So it is a fully developed uh, bare bundle flow used to, to initially test uh, the tool of a subchannel CFD. Uh, the geometry is taken from the Matisse edge uh, benchmarking experiment. Uh, which is a five by five PW rod bundle. And these two pictures on the right showing uh, the filtering mesh and the computing mesh used in this test. Um, so here is the result of the flow field uh, produced using a, a subchannel CFD simulation, uh, which is also compared with that uh, produced by uh, the resolved CFD using a runs uh, turbulence model, uh, which is shown on the right hand side. Uh, so we further uh, plotted the axial velocity over these uh, two lines for detailed comparison. Uh, for line one, uh, we also have the experimental data available to compare with. So overall, uh, subchannel CFD gives a reasonable uh, prediction of the flow uh, so distribution uh, in the rod bundle and also captures uh, some uh, subscale variation of the velocities uh, as well. Um, and uh, for the temperature field, uh, we got similar performances of the prediction uh, so as the flow field, uh, and I will not uh, go to, uh, so get into the details. Um, uh, so uh, the wall temperatures uh, can also be calculated uh, using the subchannel uh, Nusselt number correlation and the correct trend of the circumferential uh, distribution of the wall temperature can be predicted. Uh, when we compare them uh, with the trend line of the resolved simulation, uh, which is uh, so denoted by uh, the blue dashed lines here. Um, <clears throat> so with the encouraging uh, performance achieved in case study one, uh, we uh, progressively uh, increased the complexity of our case study. So uh, case study two uh, aims at flow in large 3D field assemblies. And the geometry is created based on two parallel 14 by 14 field assemblies uh, interconnected uh, to each other uh, through a water gap. Uh, the input mesh flow rate at the inlets of the two assemblies are different uh, to create a lateral uh, pressure gradient uh, so that the cross flow could be uh, established between the two uh, field assemblies. Um, um, so simulation of such a geometry using the resolved CFD is very expensive, and we estimated that a mesh consisting of around 
uh, at least uh, 400 million cells uh, may be required. So in contrast, uh, only 3.3 million uh, cells are so are sufficient in a subtrend of CFD mesh. Um, so this slide uh, shows some uh, cross flow velocity contours uh, produced by the subtrend of CFD simulation. So as you can see, they are reasonably uh, predicted. Um, we also plotted the axial velocity profiles at various locations of different heights and compared them with the experimental data and the simulation results of a subchannel analysis to COPID. Uh, so overall, uh, we got very good agreements uh, between them. Uh, so for the locations uh, in a higher section, uh, so there are a few uh, short assembly, uh, the subchannel uh, CFD results uh, tend to have better agreements with the experiment uh, than COPID. So in addition, uh, so subchannel CFD also uh, captures some uh, subscale uh, so variations of the velocity field, uh, which can never uh, be achieved using CUPID or any other kind of uh, so subchannel code. Um, and in this section, uh, as the one, uh, as, as the one followed, uh, I will talk about some uh, advanced functionality that developed recently uh, aimed at expanding the range of application of the subchannel CFD. Uh, uh, so because uh, based on a unified CFD framework, uh, so subchannel CFD is by, uh, 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 so it's by nature as uh, easily as uh, coupled with other uh, so CFD methods. Uh, so the motivation to couple it with resolved CFD uh, has been summarized uh, here. Uh, so uh, the baseline subchannel CFD uh, so by definition, it's not suitable for detailed flow and heat transfer predictions because the use of the cost grid. Uh, but in many cases, uh, the capture of some uh, so detailed physics uh, in the regions of interest is also very important, even though uh, in a subchannel CFD simulation. Uh, so this can be achieved uh, by mesh refinement or coupling with uh, resolved CFD. Uh, compared uh, with the mesh refinement, uh, the coupling has the advantage that uh, no, uh, so no significant uh, changes are required uh, to, uh, the, uh, to change the, uh, the mathematical system of subchannel. So, uh, uh, so for subchannel CFD, uh, so it is much more flexible uh, so compared with the mesh refinement method. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I will not go through the details of the theory and the methodology of the coupling and only emphasize on some key points uh, of this methodology. Uh, so this coupling is time explicit uh, and based on the domain overlapping, as it is a two-way. Uh, so we send the directly boundary conditions to the embedded uh, resolved uh, so CFD model and uh, receive feedback from it uh, to locally as offset the truncation error of the results on the cost grid. Uh, so, uh, 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 so the correction is in form of a correction as a momentum source term, uh, as, and the coupling, uh, so, and uh, uh, the information exchange is, used, uh, so is achieved using MPI, uh, so it can uh, be applied directly to the HPC runs. Um, so, uh, so this is a numerical example to initially verify the validity of uh, the coupling, uh, so which is the flow passing a square cylinder in 2D. Uh, we put a refined uh, sub mesh on top of the uh, as on top of the background cosh mesh uh, to locally improve the simulation of the flow around the cylinder. Uh, so as you can see, the coupling uh, worked as expected. So without coupling, the vortex shading cannot be captured if you use a very cost grid here. Uh, but with coupling, uh, we can capture most of the features of the oscillating wake uh, in this flow. Um, so case study three is a, uh, so is a direct application of the coupling uh, in rod bundle flows. Uh, so the geometry is a seven by seven rod bundle with nine uh, locally pruned few rods at the center. Uh, so a blockage effect is created due to the deformation of uh, the few rods, uh, uh, so which finally leads to a redistribution of the flow. Uh, so the phenomena cannot be well predicted by the baseline subchannel CFD because the correlations used for the closure modeling seems to be not accurate around the blockage. 
so we put an embedded resolved some model to cover the region where the blockage happens. So the red dash lines here show the location of our uh, resolved sum model. Uh, to see some computing cost, uh, so only one quarter of the geometry is simulated. Um, and this slide shows the meshes we used, and the first picture is a cost grade computing mesh used in uncoupled uh, baseline subchannel CFD simulation. And the second picture uh, include the same cost mesh and the refined mesh uh, for the embedded sum model uh, in a coupled simulation. And the last uh, uh, picture is a CFD uh, fine mesh. Uh, so that is used uh, uh, to produce a reference result of a CFD simulation. Um, so to show the results, uh, we plotted the axial velocity and uh, pressure uh, along the center line uh, so of the subchannel as number one, uh, where the flow is expected to be uh, complex. And this is also the location where the experimental data uh, are taken. Um, uh, so the results uh, of the couple simulation are presented uh, here in two of these figures uh, using uh, the blue and green uh, solid lines. And uh, the red line represents an uh, uh, uncoupled simulation using the baseline subchannel of CFD. And the black line is the reference result produced by a resolved CFD. Uh, covering the entire domain. Uh, so as you can see, the improvement by using the coupling is significant. Uh, so without uh, so coupling, uh, the baseline subchannel CFD cannot uh, so predict the flow well uh, across the blockage and the regions uh, so downstream. Um, and in this section, um, and I will uh, so briefly talk about the coupling uh, between subchannel CFD and the process media method. Uh, so the motivation is also very straightforward. Uh, such a coupling uh, allows the subscale structures that uh, cannot be well resolved uh, by the cost grid to be taken into account in a subchannel CFD simulation. Uh, so for example, the spacers. Uh, moreover, uh, so this uh, so technique also allows a flexible uh, simplification of any large blocks in the reactor core where the flow is of uh, no particular interest to further save the computing cost. Um, so based on the different application uh, scenarios, uh, the coupling can be achieved either by the embedding method or the interfacing method. So the difference are explained uh, so briefly in these uh, two pictures. So the embedding method is suitable for the raw bundles with attached fine structures, which result in uh, no significant changes to the basic geometry of the subchannels. So the subchannel CFD can be used to cover uh, the entire domain uh, with the embedded parts model to account for the effect of the uh, fine structures. And the interfacing uh, method, on the other hand, is a more standard approach. Uh, so there are usually uh, so separate parts media subdomains created and connected to uh, the subchannel CFD subdomains uh, through interfaces. So in theory, there are uh, no particular requirements on the geometry of the solid structures in the parts media subdomains uh, in the interfacing method. Um, so the seven by seven uh, so rock bundle case is also very suitable uh, for our case study four uh, to demonstrate uh, the coupling between subchannel CFD and cross media method. Uh, so both the embedding and the interfacing method uh, can be straightforwardly applied. Uh, first, let's look at the uh, 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 so the embedding method. Uh, so the baseline uh, so subchannel CFD mesh is created based on uh, the undeformed geometry of the rock bundle and uh, the actual uh, solids, uh, so that is related to the fuel rod ballooning, is considered using a cross media. Uh, so these two pictures are side view and uh, a top view uh, of uh, uh, the rock bundle, uh, showing where the cross uh, model is applied. Um, and this slide uh, shows the spatial distribution of the volume processes uh, based as uh, so calculated based uh, on subchannel and uh, based on the computing mesh cell. Uh, they are both uh, uh, so uh, uh, so both of the calculation method for the processes are available uh, in the current version of the subchannel CFD. 
uh, to show the simulation uh, the results, uh, we plotted uh, the subchannel uh, average the velocity and the pressure uh, for subchannel number one. Uh, so the blue and green lines uh, here uh, are the results uh, produced uh, by the process media subchannel CFD. Uh, they are based uh, on uh, the different calculation method for the volume processes. Uh, and uh, the red line is uh, the result uh, of baseline subchannel CFD uh, and the black uh, by uh, our reference CFD model. Um, so as you can see, uh, the process media subchannel CFD gives the better uh, the predictions for the velocity uh, as downstream the blockage uh, compared with the baseline subchannel CFD, uh, uh, so which may be due to the simplification of the geometry uh, have some uh, positive uh, effect uh, to improve the numerical diffusion on the cost grid. Um, um, uh, so the overall pressure drop can also uh, be correctly uh, so predicted, although the details across the blockage uh, cannot. Uh, after all, so this method is not designed uh, for such purpose. Um, uh, so for the interfacing method, uh, we can also apply it uh, into uh, this 7x7 seven seven, uh, rod bundle case. Uh, so as you can see, the region with a uh, uh, few rod distortion is considered entirely using cross media, and a separate uh, Cartesian mesh is created uh, for this region. Uh, and the picture on the right-hand side uh, shows the volume porosity in the interfacing method. Um, so we plotted uh, so similar uh, so quantities uh, as uh, for the embedding method. Uh, so the subchannel average velocity and the pressure uh, for the subchannel number one. Uh, so as you can see, um, uh, so uh, uh, so the green line here is produced by the uh, uh, so the interfacing method, and the blue line is the one uh, so produced by the embedding method. So we plotted them all in one uh, picture for better comparison. Uh, so, uh, so as you can see, overall, the velocity can also be well uh, so predicted by the interfacing method, as, as although we can observe uh, such a discontinuity as across uh, the mass joining interface here. And moreover, uh, the overall uh, so pressure drop predicted in the interfacing method is also slightly higher than that uh, also produced in other methods. Uh, so that is on, uh, so also one thing that uh, we can improve in the future. Um, <clears throat> uh, so this is the last slide of my uh, so presentation. Um, and uh, we will end up uh, this presentation with the conclusions listed here and some recommendations for the future work. Uh, so because of the time limit and I will not go through them one by one. Uh, so thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks, Bo. Um, yes, we are a, a bit short of time because I'm aware we are running a, a bit late. Um, is there one question? that people want to ask for Bo before we go on to Xiaoxu? Um, I'll ask one. Um, thank you for a very nice presentation, Bo. I really appreciate it. Can you go back to your, I think is the, the case that you compare against Cupid, um, the two assembly case. Oh, yeah, okay, so this case. Um... Right, right. Um, um, I was just uh, wonder. It seems like at level seven, um, the mixing in the experiment is a little bit more than you are predicting. Like it seems that two assemblies are mixing more. It seems to be a little bit of a, um, only the only that one because the other ones seem to be pretty close. But there does seem to be like more mixing. Is there something? Yeah toward the top of the experiment that may be causing this? Uh, yes, yes, maybe uh, in their uh, so experiment, there are uh, some structures that we didn't include it in our uh, model. So that may be the reason to cause that, because as you can see, this is the highest uh, right. 
penetration that way can be. Yeah, I was wondering if there might be like some penetrations from the top that might be like causing yeah. a bit more mixing. Yeah, and that's very interesting. Thank you. Yes, also similar as uh, the results you can uh, see from the result of Cupid. So the same uh, also a little bit under uh, the prediction of the mixing between uh, the two uh, few assemblies. Yeah. Right. The fact that it is near the top is surprising. I would expect that to be closer toward the bottom because like there'll be more mixing toward the bottom. But the fact that you have it at the top makes me think there must be something in the experiment. Um, like something, some detail missing toward the top, but that, that, I was just curious. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay thank you both. Um, Shashu, are you ready to share your presentation? Excellent. Thank you. Um. Oh, sorry. Sorry, are you able um, to make it full screen? Uh, let me try. So is it full screen now? That's better, yeah. Yes, okay. it is. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I will be talking about liquid metal thermohydraulics. Um, uh, I'm, I'm Xiaoxue Huang from uh, University of Sheffield. Um, so, uh, so for this um, talk, I'm going to uh, present uh, mm, some uh, research of, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, one of the subtasks of my work package. So it is high fidelity simulation of uh, TOS 3D test section. I will start um, with the background of the TOS 3D experiments. Then uh, I will be talking about the simulation of the TOS 3D test section which covers the uh, model setup and uh, uh, the quality of LES and uh, uh, the simulation results. Then uh, I will give a summary of this work. Um, uh, so uh, the TOS 3D experiments, mm, uh, the test facility TOS 3D, it is uh, uh, thermal hydraulic ADS lead basement Bismuth uh, loop with 3D flow test section. It is an experimental loop uh, developed at KTH in Sweden, and uh, um, it is to provide high quality data for calibration, um, benchmarking uh, for STH and uh, CFD codes. Uh, so, uh, in the test loop, there is a 3D test section um, um, in one of the legs. Uh, okay. uh, so uh, in the uh, 3D test section, it is a domain of com a complex 3D heat transfer and uh, turbulence effects. So uh, I will um, present simulate the 3D test section. Um, in terms of the um, test section, um, uh, uh, there's a heater wrapped around the upper part of the uh, outer test section wall. So uh, mm, it is uh, in dark red, red uh, in the figure show on the left hand side. Mm. Mm, uh, and in the test section pool, uh, there's a mantle plate uh, installed uh, in the upper part of the pool. Um, so this is to, uh, the plate is to prevent the LB from leaving the vessel without extensive mixing. And uh, uh, in the test section, uh, mm, uh, 140 thermocouples are installed uh, to uh, measure the temperature pre mm, temp temperature distribution. Uh, so uh, the research objectives for, uh, for, for my um, simulations, um, the first objective is to provide a benchmark database. Uh, the second objective is to uh, improve physical understanding of the combined phenomena, uh, such as the uh, impinging jet uh, and uh, thermal stratification of uh, flow mixing of liquid metal. Mm. Uh, I've carried out six simulations. 
so the first two simulations are uh, LES, LES simulations for uh, uh, with LBE as the working fluid. Uh, uh, the third and the fourth simulations are um, LES uh, with water as the working fluid. Mm. So um, the ground number of uh, of water is um, around one, but uh, the ground number um, of LB is uh, uh, around 0 0.01. So uh, those cases are to uh, um, study the influence of pronto number. Uh, and uh, the uh, last two uh, simulations are considered conjugate heat transfer. Um, so this table gives the uh, details of those six uh, simulations. Mm, so case one and case two, they are using LV as the working fluid. Mm, case one uh, is uh, with a low mm, inlet uh, flow rate. So uh, the flow regime uh, is mixed convection. And case two, uh, it has a higher inlet flow rate. It is under forced convection mm, flow regime. Uh, case three and case four, uh, they are using water as the mm, working fluid. Mm, the Reynolds number and the fraud number uh, in case three and case four are kept uh, the same as case one and uh, case two. Um, so um, to keep the Reynolds number um, and the fraud number um, the same as the LBE cases, uh, I've adjusted the injection, uh, the inflow rate and the heater power um, in case three and case four. Uh, so uh, the last uh, two cases, um, they are also using LV as the working fluid, uh, but the difference between uh, case two, five, six, and uh, case one, two, um, is uh, uh, in case five and six, uh, uh, the conjugate heat transfer uh, of the inner plate um, is considered. So, um, so um, the first two cases, they are base cases. Uh, the uh, third and the fourth cases, they are uh, with water uh, aims to uh, study the effect of ground number. Mm, and the case five and the case six, uh, they consider the conjugate heat transfer for the purpose of uh, comparison with the uh, experiments. Um, uh, as for the model setup, uh, I'm using Code Saturn version 6, uh, which is an open source finite volume code developed by EDF. Uh, the S SGS model, I've used the dynamic Smogorsky model and uh, um, some other settings for the solver is listed here. Mm, for the boundary conditions, mm, uh, the side walls of the test section, uh, it, uh, they are with constant heat flux, uh, which considers the uh, heat power and uh, the heat loss through the side walls. Uh, the side walls of the inlet and outlet pipes, uh, they are adiabatic. Mm. Uh, the, inflow, uh, the inlet uh, of the uh, model, mm, um, I'm, I've uh, applied an inflow generator, mm, which is uh, uh, adiabatic uh, pipe um, with a uh, length of 10D and uh, at uh, 5D, uh, which is the center of the uh, inlet pipe. Uh, mm, the velocity profile is copied from 5D to uh, 0D to create a fully develop, developed uh, turbulent flow. Mm. Um, so, um, in the cases without uh, conjugate transfer, the inner plate uh, is considered as adiabatic um, boundaries. Um, so, um, so here shows the meshes for case two, case one, and case two. Um, so, um, for case one, uh, the total volumes. Uh, the total number of cells uh, is 47 million. And uh, uh, in case two, the flow rate is higher. So um, the total number of cells is 75. Um, in case five and case six, um, 
an additional uh, solid domain is considered. So uh, this um, uh, other cells um, for the solid domain. Um, uh, the LES quality. Um, I'm using LES IQ to evaluate the quality of L uh, of the grid. Um, so um, um, the definition is shown here, and uh, LES is considered to be good when uh, LES IQ is larger larger than 0.8, uh, where the simulation can be considered to be. 80% or above equi equivalent to DNS. Uh, and uh, uh, in the pictures, um, the LES IQ is generally uh, higher than 0.9. Mm. Uh, then let's proceed to the simulation results. Mm, so, mm, um, the overall behavior of the two base cases are um, given here. So, uh, so case one and the case two, um, um, with the temperature and the velocity distributions, are shown in the figures. So, in case one, um, as uh, the the injection temperature is lower than uh, the cavity. Uh, the buoyancy force is object to the momentum, so we can see a negatively buoyant jet uh, penetrates into the cavity, and uh, um, it didn't reach the inner plate um, because of the uh, buoyan buoyancy effect. Um, uh, so in the cavity, we can see uh, the thermally stratif stratified um, fluid um, from the temperature distribution and also the uh, velocity uh, distribution. Uh, in case two, um, the inflow inflow rate is higher, so the the jet impinges onto the inner plate, and then a uh, large flow circulation is formed in the cavity. Mm. Um, so besides the large flow circulation, there are two small uh, circulations, one at the top and one at the bottom, um, as showing the uh, distribution of the velocity. Um, uh, here I'm comparing uh, the numerical results with the experiments. Mm, so um, case one and case three, uh, they are both for mixed convection. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, actually, it's case one and case five um, for mixed convection. Uh, um, so uh, case one is without uh, conjugate heat transfer, and the case three is a uh, case five uh, is with a uh, conjugate heat transfer. Um, um, we can see uh, the figure figure B. It is uh, um, for the inner plate. Uh, CIP uh, is along the line of CIP, which is the circular inner plate temperature. If we don't consider conjugate heat transfer, um, the temperature is much lower than experiments, but uh, if I consider the conjugate heat transfer between the inner plate and the, um, the pool, uh, the agreement, uh, uh, agreement improves sig significantly. Um, Uh, so this slide shows the comparison for force convection. Um, so the solid line is for the case without conjugate heat transfer, and the uh, dash line is uh, for the case with conjugate heat transfer. So uh, the same same results is uh, can be seen uh, in figure two or figure B here. Um, 
Uh, so if we don't have the inner plate in the simulation, uh, the temperature is much lower than the experiments. Um, but if we have uh, the uh, solid domain, um, the temperature can be uh, improved significantly. And uh, the other two lines, uh, uh, the, uh, the bottom two figures, uh, figure C and figure D, they are two vertical lines. Uh, one is along the inner inner wall. Uh, uh, the other one is uh, uh, in the pool. Uh, they are wavy compared to the previous slide. Uh, that's because uh, because of the uh, three circulations uh, in the domain. Uh, then um, I will um, uh, study. Uh, the uh, separate phenomena in the uh, simulation domains. Mm, so the first phenomena is the jet in the central region. Mm, so uh, generally, uh, a free jet flow uh, can be divided into um, uh, different regions. Uh, so the first region is the potential core, mm, which uh, has uh, a uniform central line velocity distribution. Uh, then the second region is uh, interaction region, which the central line velocity starts to decay, and the shear layers uh, between the jet and the ambient uh, from both sides uh, starts to merge. Um, and uh, the third region is the self similar similar region uh, which uh, uh, the radial uh, velocity profiles are similar uh, with with a proper um, appropriate scales um, and the, the last region is the termination region uh, in which the center line velocity decays quite rapidly um, so um, in this slide, uh, I'm showing the jet uh, development uh, for case one and case two. Uh, so our center line temperature and the velocities are uh, show here. And uh, so in each figure, the solid line shows the center line values and uh, the dash line shows, uh, uh, the dash line is used to um, evaluate the self-similarity, uh, self-similar region. Mm, um, um, some values are uh, listed on, uh, at the uh, right-hand side. Mm, so the major mm, findings here, um, for the temperature distribution, uh, for both cases, the self-similarity uh, generally starts from 5 to 6 D, uh, whereas for the velocity, it starts from uh, around 2 D. So um, that means the, uh, the self-similarity in terms of temperature uh, occurs later than the velocity. Uh, so this is because of the high conductivity of liquid metal, uh, which makes the decay of the temperature occur later. Mm. Mm. So as for the decay rate, um, in the forced convection case, the temperature decay rate is uh, higher than the mixed convection case. Um, so uh, mm, uh, this is uh, uh, because uh, the ambient of the mixed convection case is thermally stratified. So then, uh, so then uh, the center line temperature gradient is smaller, whereas the in the forced convection case, the ambient is better mixed. Mm. So uh, that is uh, why in the forced convection case, uh, the decay rate is uh, 0.398, and uh, uh, in the mixed convection case, the, the decay rate is 0.1173. Mm. Uh, 
uh, as for the velocity decay, uh, in mixed convection case, the decay rate is uh, uh, 0 0.215. And, uh, so it is higher than in the forced convection case. And this is because the negatively buoyant force uh, is stronger uh, in the mixed convection ca case. Um, so this slide shows the comp comparison uh, of uh, case three and case four. Uh, case three and case four are using water as the working fluid. Mm, so uh, the major findings here is uh, um, the start of the self-similarity, self-similar region for uh, those two cases are uh, three to four. Um, so uh, they are uh, uh, they are uh, quite similar. Uh, but uh, in the case, um, in the uh, previous two cases, the uh, temperature self-similarity uh, happens later than the velocity. Mm. Um, uh, as for the decay rate, uh, the decay rate presents the same as LBE. Mm. So the decay rate of temperature for force convection is higher than uh, that in mixed convection. Uh, and it's also because the thermal gradient is more significant, uh, while uh, in the fossil convection, uh, it is uh, better mixed. And uh, uh, the decay rate for the velocity is higher in the mixed convection, uh, uh, also due to the opposite direction of the buoyancy force and the inertial force. Um, and, uh, uh, so this slide shows the um, self-similarity of uh, the radial distributions of temperature and the uh, velocity. Um, so this is for case one and case two. Mm, um, the conclusions here. Um, so uh, for case one, uh, the temperature uh, the temperature distribution with large radius, uh, it doesn't follow uh, the uh, theory, it doesn't follow the theory. Uh, uh, that is because uh, it is a uh, density stratified uh, ambient, but the theory is for the uh, free jet. And uh, uh, for case two, uh, the velocity does not follow uh, the theory. Um, and uh, this is uh, because uh, the geometry is a uh, uh, confined uh, geometry and uh, uh, the large flow circulation in the cavity uh, influences the, um, the, uh, the velocity at large radius. Um, so uh, this is uh, the self-similarity for case three and case four and uh, uh, the conclusions are generally uh, similar to the previous results uh, for those uh, for for LBE. Um, then um, um, I'll give some more details about the uh, the boundary developments uh, along the side walls. Um, so. Um, so this shows the velocity uh, uh, velocity distribution and the temperature distribution for case one and the case two. Mm. Uh, uh, so the thermal stratification along the side wall is quite obvious. Um, so the temperature distribution, uh, it is, uh, increasing with the height. Uh, mm, and uh, um, uh, for the velocity, mm, uh, for the velocity at a at, uh, low distance mm, from the bottom, uh, it is quite uh, quiet, mm, but mm, from uh, point, C, 
to 0.8R, we can see uh, a boundary layer development. Mm. Uh, I'm currently uh, studying a, a, a similarity solution for the uh, boundary layer development to uh, compare with these results. Uh, um, um, so, uh, so uh, this is the um, temperature and the velocity distributions uh, along the sidewall uh, for case two. Oh, case two should be the fossil convection. And uh, mm, so uh, generally the velocity uh, is negative uh, because the mm, fluid is uh, flowing down downwards along the side wall uh, after uh, impinging to the uh, to the inner plate. Mm. Um. So a wall jet is um, is formed along the uh, side wall. Mm. And uh, uh, from the temperature distribution, um, with with large height, uh, the temperature is uh, uh, is smaller. So the buoyancy force buoyancy force is actually uh, aiding the wall jet flow. Mm. So uh, this slide gives the summary of. Uh, this part of the work. Um, we have uh, carried out LES simulations uh, to investigate the TOS 3D test section under statistical uh, steady states. So two base cases with LBE under different flow regimes are analyzed. Mm, the general behavior of the two base cases uh, in the mixed convection case, uh, a negatively buoyant jet in a density stratified ambient is observed. Uh, in the fossil convection case, uh, a impinging jet with a large flow rate, a flat, large flow circulation is uh, found. And uh, 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 we notice that conjugate heat transfer is quite important in, in terms of predicting the temperature of the inner plate. Um, um, uh, so, um, as for the jet development, um, we found um, uh, with LBE, self-similarity in the temperature field occurs later than uh, the uh, than that in the velocity field, and uh, um, the decay rate of the temperature is larger in the force convection case compared to that in the mixed convection case. Uh, decay rate of velocity is smaller in the fossil convection case uh, compared to that in the mixed convection case. Um, so as for the uh, boundary layer developments, thermal stratification along the uh, sidewall is observed in the mixed convection case and the wall jet along the side wall is observed in the uh, fossil convection case. Uh, so, okay, so that's the uh, presentation. So thank you for listening. Excellent, thanks, Xiaoxu. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone have any questions for her? Um, yeah, I have an... Um, one simple question. So basically, I show there is a, a benchmark uh, to compare the experimental result to the uh, LES simulation here. And uh, does the um, does the um, experiments show any um, kind of error range of the environment? Because I didn't see any error bars in the figures. Uh You mean the error range of the experimental measurement? Experiment, yes. Uh, uh, 
Yes, they've mentioned that uh, uh, the thermocouples, um, the error range is within, I think it's 2.2K or 2K, uh, but I didn't show it in the figures. Okay. Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, another thing is about the uh, LEA simulation itself is uh, um, uh, did you compare I'm, I'm not sure whether they supplied the uh, like um, inlet flow profile like uh, velocity distribution turbulence level uh, uh, did you uh, did you consider these um, uncertainties in your experiment no no in your LES sorry not, not experiment Uncertainties. Uh. So uh, the question is: uh, Did you uh, did the inlet boundary conditions in your LES simulation match with the experimental measurement? Uh, inlet uh, velocity distribution. Uh, they don't have experimental measurements. Uh, but actually, I. Uh, I'm now comparing the inlet um, inlet velocity distributions with uh, some other simulations. But, um, but a lot of with experiments, right? Uh, there's no experiment for the inlet. They just have uh, temperature measurements. Okay. Mm. So yeah, there's there's no measurement of the velocity profile. There's, there's just a mass flow through the mm. that, that 3D shape section. Um, yeah, my it, point it's worth is noting that. In my point is this sorry, may no. uh, my point is this, this may uh, introduce some uncertainties in the LES simulation. Um, yeah, the, yeah. The, the part of the reason for doing this model is that it's a simplified version of the experiment, so it doesn't include the, the metal container around the 3D tech section or the insulation. So no. part of the reason for doing this is to provide a, a sort of benchmark set of data. So it will not be able to match the experimental data exactly because it, it isn't modeling the exact geometry. But what the aim is, is that we can then use this LES simulation to 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 assess the the RANS models that we're doing at Fraser Nash. Yeah, understandable. Yes. So it's 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 not necessary exactly to match the experiment with with Jerry's work. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we've now reached the end of the the presentations. Um, I know we are. A, bit over time and, and obviously some people have got to go. Um, in the agenda there is a sort of uh, open Q&A session. If, if people are, are, are still up for, for staying on and asking questions then I'm, I'm happy to, to carry on for another 10-20 minutes. Um, it's, it's up to, to everyone on, on the call really to see if they've got questions more generally around the the base program or, or about any of the presentations or part of the work that's going on. Either un unmute your mic or, or put something into the, the chat and we can answer them. Richard, it's Lee from Nuclear MRC. Um, thank you for the presentation. It's, uh, it's well informed. Um, as you mentioned, uh, this uh, digital reactor program funded uh, by um, NAEP phase one uh, is more, almost yeah. finished. What's your plan to continue the research in the nuclear thermal hydraulic uh, project? Um, um. Okay, uh, we, we would obviously love to carry on um, the, the thermal hydraulics research. It is very much in the hands of the UK government, um, unfortunately. Um, Bayes uh, and NIRO, the Nuclear Innovation Research Organisation, are, are currently putting together the business pay case for the, the next five years of funding from 2021 to 2026. Um, if you read uh, uh, read through the recent NIRAB report, um, it's provided a number of recommendations to government on on 
the next phase of research and, and the sort of budget that they're recommending. Um, obviously that's not guaranteed and it, it will come down to a discussion um, and business case between for Bayes to make to, to the Treasury. Um, and then depending on how that goes, it will depend on what invitations to tender come out through through Bayes. Um, but obviously we are hopeful that this, this work or, or, or an extension of this work will carry on to continue the developing the UK capability for, for advanced reactors. Okay, thank you, Richard. Any other questions? Maybe I can ask a second one, if I may, Richard. Yes, go for it. <laughs> um, I know there's another consortium, which is uh, um, NVAC, you mentioned about. And uh, yeah. they have a couple of years and left to run the program. In your view, and uh, how are we going to couple the NTH into the digital twin and to help the um, the digital reactor designs and obviously and uh, the, the the nuclear new build uh, almost matured and uh, so the next challenge will be SMRs and AMR and so what are your views and how these uh, communities and uh, to develop the digital twin capabilities um, to help yeah. with the nuclear industries and the designs advanced uh, reactor. Um, Obvious, so obviously, the, the and the, obviously, this question is open for the audience and uh, if anyone have, um, can contribute their own views. Yeah, so the, 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 the NVEC program is, is theoretically finishing at the same time as the thermal hydraulics. So the, the original end date is, is March 2021. Um, we, we are speaking to Jacobs and, and, and sort of talking to them on a regular basis. The, the whole aim of our program is to develop tools and methods and, and knowledge that is independent of exactly which tool. So we've used Fluent, we've used um, Code to Turn, but actually what we've done and, and what we're intent, what we've what we're looking at is, is almost independent of the actual CFD code you're using. Um, within MVEC, they are looking at um, how to implement and, and run CFD codes within their tool set. Um, and, and I'm sure if there is a phase three, we will, we will take that further and, and look at actually running things within, within MVEC. Um, but yes, I agree. I completely agree that, you know, as a, as a UK capability, we need to bring them together um, so that we can get the maximum value from both, both the developments. Thank you. I don't know if, any, if anyone else on the call would like to add anything to that. I'm aware that some of the people involved in the NVEC program are, are involved uh, online. Okay, um, I think if, if there aren't any more questions, I think it, it just allows me to, to, to bring the, everything to a close. Um, I, I would like to, to thank everyone that's presented. I think it's been some really interesting presentations um, and I've certainly sort of enjoyed and learned something from the, the ones this morning. Um, and thank you very much for Wei Wang to organizing it all. Um, it's had a, a good, good attendance from, from a wide range of people across the UK. Well, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for, for joining in. Okay, indeed, uh, Richard, uh, thank you, uh, especially to where you are, as you said, for actually spent a lot of time in putting this uh, program together. And also uh, earlier, particularly to actually get up very early, give us a very interesting yeah. discussion and offer opinions from from uh, with his experience, uh, that was really appreciated. And um, thank, thank you, everyone else, who actually made the presentation or joined the uh, uh, this online discussion. So yeah, uh, if 
not anything else, let's close this and we should see you in not far away future. Thank you.